Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I heard it was very crowded coming back from lunch, so I'm sure we can expect some uh, more people trickling in. Thank you so much for your patience um, as we get rolling a few minutes late here to um, account for the crowds today. Um, so welcome. Thank you for staying. Um, this is our afternoon panel um, case studies um, in technical art history, in Impressionism, in Post-Impressionism. We have um, some fantastic speakers and some very interesting um, stories and uh, examples lined up to introduce to you this afternoon. Um, we also have George Shackelford, our keynote speaker from yesterday, um, who is going to be moderating the panel discussion and I'm sure um, introducing some, some new kind of probing questions and helping us to synthesize uh, all of the new information that's being presented to us. So without further ado, and in, in the interest of time, I'll uh, launch into introducing the speakers for our first case study, um, Kelly Keegan and Pablo Garcia. So Kelly is the Assistant Paintings Conservator here at the Art Institute of Chicago. Her current focus includes research and treatment of 19th and 20th century paintings and contemporary technical imaging and imaging processing techniques. Um, she's one of our technical whizzes, um, I can say, I think, from somebody outside the department. That's how I see you. Some of her recent research projects include the materials and techniques of impressionist artists such as Pierre Auguste Renoir, Gustave Caibat, and Camille Pizarro, um, which we will get a little deeper into this, our uh, Kaibat painting, our very famous painting today. Um, her collaborator, Pablo Garcia, is assistant professor in contemporary practices at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago across the street. His artwork draws from a system of research studying the intersection of art and technology, the analog and the digital, or the virtual and the real. Garcia is the author of drawingmachines.org, a website documenting the history of mechanical and optical drawing tools from the Renaissance to the present, and he has one of the most comprehensive private collections of vintage camera lucidas in the world. So I think that we're in for a very, very interesting um, talk here. So without further ado, Kelly and Pablo. Good afternoon. So discovering the process of our painting, our famous Kaibat painting, was a really a complicated puzzle that involved a lot of different pieces, including the original site in Paris, preparatory works, technical examination, and of course, collaboration. Um, so our painting was painted by Gustave Kaibat in 1877, but our story of discovery really begins with the cleaning of the painting two years ago by Faye Rubel. And the cleaning revealed some really interesting things, and those things inspired us to give it a thorough technical examination, and that produced the online catalog, which was released last summer. So the cleaning, one of the things that it revealed was that the sky had been overpainted by a previous restorer. And with that and the discolored varnish removed, we could see that the sky now shows this variation. And that actually resembled the sky in a known preparatory painting at the Musée Marmottin. And that is actually one of many known preparatory works for our painting. Um, there are drawn sketches for all of the figures, and there's this architectural drawing in the Art Institute collection, which was examined by Princeton Drawings conservator Tony Owen as part of this study. Now, how that drawing related to both the original site in Paris and our painting were among our first and biggest questions. Um, so other areas that were also overpainted previously and were now removed included the left edge. And once that was removed, other oddities became apparent, like, where's the rest of that carriage? Um, so there are a lot of details of our painting that sort of get fuzzy along that faintly visible black painted line. And this was one of a few indications we had that Kaibat started this painting off the stretcher, probably tacked to the studio wall. We could see here in a pre-treatment detail that the horizon line of our painting actually goes off the edge of the stretcher. Also, when we look at our black painted line and we compare it to our architectural drawing, we can see that the edge of the composition on this side actually lines up with the edge of our drawing. So we think that Kaibot wanted to end his composition here. And when he finally stretched his canvas, seemed to leave himself a little wiggle room. There's documentary evidence that he did this with another painting. So if we have our painting as it is now, and we reframe it to where we think 
Kaibot wanted his composition to end visually, it would look like this. So you may see this in the future. So we learned all these things in the cleaning, and then we started look, wanting to look deeper. And since we can't call up Kaibot and ask him how he made his painting, we have to uh, look at documentary evidence and technical imaging and let the painting talk to us. So one of the major revelations came with the x-ray of the painting, and that's one of the first and most basic things that we do when we do a technical examination. So an x-ray, some of you may have seen some other lectures, sees all the way through the painting, and so we can see the stretcher around the sides and across the middle, we can see the nails holding the canvas to the stretcher, and we can also see something about the way the painting was constructed. Uh, certain materials, certain dense materials like lead white paint will block the x-ray and appear white. And so we can see that we have a lot of dense paint. And the paint, that dense paint is mostly in the background. We can see that the figures don't have that same density and also that the background does not pass underneath them. And that can be an indication that Kaibot drew his composition before he painted it. And so you can see what appear to be lines around certain features like the umbrellas. So it's important that these are evidence of probable lines, but not the lines themselves. These are just areas where the paint is very, very thin. But if we look at the figures, one figure sort of looks different than all the others, and that's that figure on the far right. You can see the architecture passes underneath him. There's a lot of brushwork. He appears as if he were added on top. When we look in the architecture next to him, we saw another thing that was sort of curious, and that was a faint vertical feature. And when we looked back at our painting on the surface, we could see under the microscope that some of the sort of salmon-colored paint from the far right building seemed to have extended closer to the female figure. And here you can see right next to her arm, it's been scraped away. Um, and then up in the tan building up top, we can see that pink paint peeking out from underneath. And so it appears that uh, originally that building was much closer to the figure. And we can see when we line it up with our drawing again that that's actually where that building is in the architectural drawing. So it became clear that Kaibot uh, originally had the paint, it looked more like this, with the building very close to that figure, and then he moved the building and finally added that figure. Interestingly, that figure also appears to be an addition in the painted sketch I mentioned earlier. And we can see, if we look closely at that, the white paint again underneath that figure. So it, it suggests a kind of back and forth that Kaibot is going back to his preparatory work, sort of trying things out before he takes them to the big canvas. So I talked a little bit about the fact that Kaibot may have drawn his composition first. So the way that we look for underdrawing is typically with infrared. And so if X-ray sort of sees all the way through the painting, infrared sees through a little bit at a time, depending on the wavelength. And so we can shine the light at the painting in different ways to see different things. And so if we shine the light through the painting, we get a transmitted infrared, which is this. And so you can see a lot of underdrawing, especially with regard to the figures. But more often than not, we shine the light at the painting for reflected infrared. And as I said, depending on the filters used, different materials will appear dark, will absorb. And so here are two infrared images with two different cameras, so you get a sense of what that looks like. Now, this second image was taken by John Delaney and Kate Dooley from the National Gallery, and there they are on the right with that camera. Uh, they also brought with them a hyperspectral camera. So it makes sense if we have filters that certain materials will absorb or appear dark according to the filter, the more filters you use, the fewer wavelengths you let through, the more specific the materials that will appear dark in that image. So we can combine three of these images. We can take image number one and say everything that's dark in this image appears red, and image number two, everything that's dark will appear green, and for image number three, it will be blue. And we do that and we get what we call a false color infrared, and that's what we see here. And we can see a ton of underdrawing in this image, especially with regard to the buildings, and here I've reinforced some of that in blue. So we can see evidence of these lines, but we can't really see what they're made of. And for that, we have to go back to the surface of the painting. And under the microscope, we could see evidence that there was underdrawing in charcoal, in blue and black paint, and in red lake paint. So this examination of all of our technical images revealed a myriad of changes. All of the figures had been adjusted in some way. They seemed sort of fussed over. Every fold of their garment, the brims of their hats, the umbrella handles, the female figure was originally ungloved, terribly scandalous. 
Um, a lot of the architectural features and details, trims and chimneys, were also adjusted. Um, and also, he added a couple of figures, including the two figures over the main gentleman's shoulder. He also scraped part of this man's face down just to give him that mustache. So we look at our painting and we wonder, how did Kaibot get the space so convincing? And that's with his use of something called linear perspective. And so that's the sort of phenomenon where you're looking down a straight road and the edges of the road seem to meet at a point on the horizon. And that point is a vanishing point. And so we can see in the IR image, I've reinforced a couple of lines and extended them that they meet at a point on the horizon. So each avenue pictured in our painting has a point along the horizon. And when we looked at this particular infrared image, we noticed something curious about our vanishing points. They were pinholes. I had no idea why, but again, it suggests that the painting was tacked to a studio wall. Now, what, f what these pinholes were for would not become apparent until much later. Um, so again, if we want to talk about Kaibot's use of perspective, we might need to go back a step to our drawing. And again, if I overlay the outlines of the drawing on our painting, the closeness with which they match suggests some sort of direct transfer. And in the beginning, I could just see this in Photoshop and I couldn't really prove it. But when we examined it and we looked at some of the distances in our drawing, it seemed to be at a ratio of one to seven. But how Kaibot got a drawing that's this tiny to a painting that big also was not something that was apparent right away. So the examination of the drawing revealed it also had some interesting things, some of which made sense and some didn't. Uh, when Tony looked at this under the microscope, she noticed a bunch of microscopic indentations. These seemed to be, when she plotted them across the drawing, they seemed to fall along the vertical axis and the horizon and at a lot of interesting intersections of architectural elements. The drawing itself also represents sort of two phases of drawing. So it's essentially two drawings on a single sheet of paper. The first is a sort of on-site sketch, and that's in these sort of sketchy lines, and I'm just using this side of the building as an example. Um, in the second set, you can see the angle of those lines changes slightly. Kaibot takes the drawing back to his studio, uses a ruler, and there we have a second set of lines. Now the second step is where he sort of tightened up and clarified the perspective. And so we can sort of see when we extend these lines, how that looks. One interesting thing about this is that he sort of widened all of the buildings ever so slightly. So he moved those vanishing points away just a few millimeters on the drawing, but basically what it does is it makes the vantage, as in our point of view, in the drawing as well as the painting, at eye level. So it's important to remember that the steeper angles that we see in the on-site sketch suggest a vantage, an on-site vantage of slightly lower than eye level. Then we wanted to figure out how Kaibot made this drawing. And so the fidelity of the drawing to the site in Paris has led, and here it is as it appears today, has led many scholars to posit that Kaibot used an optical device. The intersection itself is a really complicated, in true Parisian style, an eight-point intersection of five different streets. But among the uh, options that Kaibot had at that time to capture that scene, were uh, the photographic camera, so he could have traced a photograph or the ground glass on a photographic camera. However, Tony's examination revealed the paper is far too thick for that. The second option is called a camera obscura, or more specifically, a tent camera obscura. But you can see from this diagram, the vantage would therefore be too high. It looks very much above eye level. And so the literature mentions this thing called a camera lucida. And maybe you knew what that was, but I did not. I could find pictures and treatises and instructions, but none of them really made sense. And so in my late night Googling, I came across this, which is uh, a Kickstarter for something called a Neo Lucida, and it's a contemporary Camel Lucida for current artists. And one of its makers happens to be my colleague Pablo Garcia, who works across the street at the School of the Art Institute. So we began a new collaboration, and here he is. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of funny because uh, I do get asked from time to time about uh, vintage optical drawing tools, but uh, to be asked uh, to just walk across the street made it really simple uh, to have a start a conversation. Um, 
So what I said to them is what I say to you now. Camera Lucida is very simply an optical drawing aid that lets you trace what you see. Um, it was invented in 1807 by the Scottish scientist William Hyde Wollaston, and the genius of it is that it's just a very small prism on an adjustable stand. And when you look down into the prism, you see both the subject in front of you and your hand at the same time, but kind of projected simultaneously. Um, and as a drawing aid, it is quite lovely and quite simple to use. Um, our Neo Lucida was very similar uh, to the same optics. Like it was an art historical project. So my colleague Golan Levin and I had this idea in 2013. What if we could introduce this tool in a very inexpensive way to our students and to other educators to kind of further the conversation of the history of art and technology relationships, which is what we're really interested in. Um, and so as you can see here, what, how the Neo Lucida works, you clamp it to the table and you can trace what you see. And because it was an art historical project, it effectively worked just like the vintage tools from the 19th century, something a little bit like this. So you take your subject, you place it in front of your, your uh, camera lucida, you look down into it, and you can see here there's a kind of translucent area as the prism beam splits between what your subject is and your paper at the same time. And I know about this because, as was mentioned at the beginning, I have an extensive collection of camera lucidas that I've been collecting for the last 10 years. Um, I got my first one, uh, this silver one here, circa 1900, and started to realize that there are other designs and other types, and so, uh, so because, there's, because there's actually very little literature on how they work, I started to do direct research. I started to use them myself for my own drawing projects. So when the Art Institute said, hey, what, uh, could this have been used? I said, I don't know, let's, co let's go over and, and find out. Uh, I, so I brought over a bunch of my vintage ones, particularly mid to late 19th century models, which would have been ones that Kaibach could have used. Uh, and the first thing was just to see whether or not the viewing angle of what you could see through the prism of the camera lucida would fit the drawing. Um, and at a, at a tall extension, it, it seemed very clear that it fit quite nicely. And here you can see Tony and I are kind of experimenting with that. And the nice thing about a camera lucid is that it's perfectly portable. Unlike a camera obscura, which requires a lot of equipment and pure darkness, this can work outdoors. And so artists were ten tended to take these uh, devices, put them on a little adjustable drawing table, go out into the field, and you could draw a landscape very easily. The question still remained, uh, well, did Kayabat actually use this for this painting um, and this drawing specifically? And I said, well, there's only one way to find out. You send me to Paris with a perfect one-to-one -one replica of the drawing, so it matches perfectly in color and dimension. Uh, I'll bring my camera lucidas and a drawing table and we'll find out. And they said, great, when can you go? Uh, and so there it is set up on the exact spot. Uh, where, where Kayabat worked, and this was a little bit like a kind of a divining rod. I had to kind of set it up. We knew approximately where the intersection was, where the spot was, within a few feet, but I sat there and actually kind of started to adjust and move around, up and down a little bit. I remember asking a lot of questions. Well, how tall was Kayabat? Was he tall enough to have had it up here, or would it have to have been lower? Because this is a kind of three-dimensional puzzle to try to figure out. But with a little bit of work, after a couple hours kind of testing it out, I was able to uh, line some things up. So there's the replica of the drawing with the ghost image above, and as you pull back, you can see there I am on the spot. So that definitely suggests that it was very possible that Kaiba could have used it. It matches a lot of what, um, what Kelly had already mentioned, that it was the right angle, the right vantage point, the right size, and I could find an actual location where, where it worked. So then the second question was, how did he go from this drawing to the large canvas? Um, and I think, as, as Kelly mentioned, there were a few things that he did after he did that drawing on the street that were, were really telltale signs that something was going on uh, back in the studio. So for example, uh, you can see there's this little horizon line there, but that's drawn after uh, we realized that the, the apparent uh, vanishing point of the building uh, sides were actually at two different levels. Now this probably comes from two different th reasons. One is that the street itself is not flat. There's a kind of slope kind of up and to the right, and so the vanishing point would be slightly adjusted as a result of that. But also, you know, drawing 
through this tiny little prism does cause small imperfections. So he might have sat there and said, well, I can't quite conform this drawing neatly for transfer. And it seems that what he did was add a kind of horizon line right in between. They, they're almost perfectly between the two, almost like he took a ruler and said, oh, that's three, three millimeters apart. I'll make it one and a half and just split the difference. And then from there, there are these tick marks on the drawing outlined here in red that show the new vanishing points of what he draws for the building. So this had the effect, as Kelly mentioned, of kind of stabilizing the horizon line at a certain vantage point. Uh, but it also did something very useful for uh, Kai about the transfer artist. Now, I'm trained as an architect, uh, so a lot of this stuff seemed kind of logical to me. I would do anything I could to kind of make the drawing as clean and simple as possible, maintaining accuracy, but making the next step a lot easier for, for drafting methods. Um, so these little indentations were a pretty big clue for me, because what seemed familiar was drawings that I had done when I was in school that, like this one, had little small indentations all around the drawing. And my suspicion was that they were, that Kaibot was using dividers. Um, you might call them calipers, but really they're dividers. And what you, what you do with them is you very simply just spread them out to a distance between, let's say, two lines on your drawing, and then move that over to a ruler to find out the measurement. That way you can make a note and multiply. You may have seen movies where like a ship's captain does that thing where they kind of take the divider and they go spin, 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 because he's calculating, oh, I can move 100 miles a day, I spin it three times, it takes three days to go 300 miles. It's that kind of tool, very simple way to transfer information from one drawing to another. And by the way, we know Kaibot's la later uh, life spent, well, he was spent doing naval architecture, um, and there he is even using the said tool right there. So with a replica of the drawing uh, on a wall, I, I began to attempt a translation from the drawing to a full-scale prepared canvas um, as he might have done. Uh, so here I am with my own set of uh, modern dividers. And essentially what we did was say, okay, here's the drawing, here's the canvas. Um, what I would do is I create an origin point. There's this, this one spot on the drawing and then one spot on the wall where I would use as my kind of zero point. Uh, from there, I would take a measurement with the divider, go to a ruler, take that calculate measurement, calculate times seven, and then transfer it over to the drawing um, with a ruler. Then there was those little pinholes that, that Kelly mentioned, which were curious, and that actually had me stumped for a second until I started to think a little bit about my, again, my efficient ways of drafting uh, from, from my youth. Um, and I thought, makes sense actually, if you think about the size of the drawing. You put a tack in the vanishing point because there's a way to make the drawing a little bit easier if you don't have to spread your arms around this far to aim one spot to a vanishing point and then rotate your ruler so that you can get to the actual point you want to meet. Much easier if you just put a tack in there and let the ruler rest on that so that you can do the close detail work of aligning the other side of the ruler. And I would assume, not being a painter, that, uh, that Kaibot would know that he will, well, he's just gonna paint over those holes anyway, no big deal. Um, and so it kind of looks a little bit like this. You basically line it up and then rotate it in place and you can make a nice, simple drawing of that, right? Really efficient, really smart. Uh, shows someone who knew how to kind of handle engineering and drafting tools. So it was a fun ex exercise for me to be able to kind of reverse engineer a little bit about the art and technology relationship that Kaibot had, um, and also to kind of mimic uh, what could have been his, his method. So here is my kind of full size canvas that does align with the drawing uh, and quite closely does align with the painting, uh, suggesting that, in fact, this is how he may have transferred from a simple drawing on the street to the grand painting that we see today. Thank you.
with which they seem to be constructed, it, it looks more like a ruler, I think, than a snap line. When I, and actually, it was hard to tell in the photo, but when we set it up, I, I took the origin point. I actually had a piece of string there hanging to test out, like, oh, could I use it? Like, could I, and I realized it's, it's an extra step of, like, marking off the distance of the string and then hanging the string and then make sure you're pulling it and then, oh, right, when you pull it, you're actually gonna stretch it by one-tenth of one percent, but over that distance now, things are off. Better just to have a long ruler, um, and it seemed to be a lot easier. So, and again, back to the pinholes. Well, now you have the straight edge, it's heavy, so the pinhole with the tack makes a lot of sense to do that pivoting move. So, essentially, there were like two real steps. There's the origin zero, you know, story pole area, from which I would take the caliper divider measurements and then draw them out along this conformed horizon line, and then from the horizon line, I could move upward to find verticals. And once I had established enough of the verticals and horizontals based on where we saw those, those little indentations, then I could start connecting. All right, now we're ready to welcome Anne Honigswald to the podium. Anne is the Senior Conservator of Paintings at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., where her particular focus has been on late 19th century and early modern works. She's widely known in her field and has held fellowships and participated in collaborative and, in, and interdisciplinary projects with many institutions. At the present moment, she's writing and coordinating the conservation content of the National Gallery's forthcoming catalog of late 19th century painting and is awaiting publication of two essays, one on the issue of finish in paintings by Edgar Degas and one on 19th century ground preparations. She has also published widely on Picasso and Malevich, matte paint surfaces, oil sketches, and the history of restoration. So please join me in welcoming Anne. Thank you very much, Jill, and thank you for inviting me for this wonderful um, event. Um, for both art historians and for the public, there's always been a fascination um, with this picture by Edward Manet. It was painted in 1862. And what's, one of the things that's very interesting about it, it's a canvas that remained in his studio until his death. Um, partly, it, um, this particular interest really stems from the ambiguity of the composition. Uh, the subject, the setting, the relationship of the characters that we see, the connection between this picture and um, the absinthe drinker from Copenhagen, um, and also the sources. There's um, a lot of people have spoken about the relationship between this and the artist Luna, Watteau, and Velasquez, among many others. Um, these are all topics that have never really been resolved. Um, it's also been a focus simply because of its size. It's over six by eight feet, but after the Kayabat, I guess that's sort of nothing. Um, and maybe this is a session on large pictures this afternoon, I don't know. Um, and also the fact that this was Manet's first scale multi-figure composition, which is still intact, makes it of great interest. Uh, I think it's particularly uh, appropriate to mention this here um, because the Art Institute exhibits a remnant of one of, such, uh, one of these large compositional paintings, which was, in fact, cut apart. Um, and what I'm showing here is the print, which, of course, is flipped from what the painting would have um, looked like. And what hangs here is the boy with the pic picture, which is one element that was cut out of the, the larger composition. Now, another... Um, element which makes the old musician so alluring is no doubt its unavailability because um, it's part of the Chesterdale collection at the National Gallery of Art. And by legal agreement, these pictures cannot um, leave the building. And I have to say, I think we're all somewhat um, drawn to all those things we haven't, that we can't have. So it, it, I think it's interesting to many people for that, for that as well. Now, Chesterdale lent the picture to the National Gallery of Art from his home in New York in 1941, and that's the year that the National Gallery opened. And it hung in um, that space for nearly seven decades with very little conservation work or technical study on it. And it was treated um, several years ago in the conservation studio, mainly because with time, um, there were many layers of 
varnish on the picture, um, which had yellowed, they had darkened as they'd aged, and what we were very aware of was that this distorted the tonalities that were intended, it very much obscured the brushwork, and it really altered the composition spatially. Now, it might also be interesting to note that what appealed to Chester Dale and to his wife Maud when they pur purchased the picture in 1930 was the color. They specifically said um, that this picture was not muddy like so many other Manets. And Maud was an artist, and I'm certain that she was particularly sensitive to this. I'm quite sure they would have probably been rather disappointed to see how the old musician had changed with time. So we discussed the possible treatment of this painting for years, and I have to say nobody anticipated the remarkable visual transformation or the discoveries that would em um, emerge about the process of painting. The intervention and the study was very much a collaborative effort between the conservator, the art historian, and the scientific research team, as I'm going to explain as I speak. It's likely that the picture had never been cleaned, or if it was, a varnish was removed only locally, and that's a little unusual. We usually, when a conservator works on a painting, we are pretty aware that other restorers um, had worked on pictures before us. Um, however, although I don't think the varnish was ever removed, the painting does appear to have been lined very, very early in its history, and this is rather also interesting, um, because I think it could have been lined even before the artist started working on it, and I'm finding that this is the case with a great number of these large manets. Um, we also find that the edges were modified and expanded. Um, again, this is a, a wonderful parallel to the Kayabat. Um, so that the original tacking margins, what had originally held the canvas to the stretcher, were now um, incorporated into the composition. And again, um, I can't tell you the number of manets that, that we've seen where you can actually identify the tack, the, the tack holes along the edge, which indicates that at one point they must have been um, uh, tacked around the side. Um, I'm assuming that this um, extension was done at the time of the lining. The picture, though, although it hadn't, has never been cleaned, um, had been varnished over and over again, um, probably by um, various restorers at the request of dealers, at the request of owners, we're not certain. Um, this was probably done to saturate some of the dark colors, which had a tendency to sink in um, and take a grayish cast, and some people must have assumed that the more varnish they put on, the, um, the more legible the painting might be. The removal of the discolored varnish revealed a very dramatic shift in the tonality and a wonderful contrast in the lights and the darks as, it, as was intended. It exposed a stunning range of browns and blacks, really not unlike what we see, oh, I'm sorry, I missed this one, which is the before and after. But what I want to point out is um, what happened, and, and so you really can have a sense of what this looked like, go into the galleries and look at the two wonderful um, manets that we have here, because this also shows what happens with the darks, how rich these browns and blacks, and in this case these deep blues are, and the nuances that, that one finds. Um, so as the um, yellow coating was removed, of course the greens moved black, back to blue, the yellows became white again, and all these subtle um, tones really reemerged. The exposed ground also appeared to be um, the, the whitest white that I've probably ever seen, and I thought that was fascinating. Um, and especially, and I think this was very important to Manet, he contrasted this very white ground, which he allowed to remain exposed in many places, to the white, white pigment. Um, I think even more remarkable, though, was all the vibrant brushwork that became legible again in the picture. And now removing this, this amber veil um, also enhanced the character of the fabrics of each of the figure's garments. Uh, Manet had the ability to sort of emulate very distinct textures, the soft drape of the boy's linen shirt against the gossamer fabric of the, the girl's dress. There's this wonderful texture of the homespun cloth next to the, um, the, the rough wool of the folds of the musician's cloak. And these all reemerged as the artist intended 
And I can't help but to want to show this image, um, which is my favorite bit of fashion, which are the blue socks, um, which I really feel took on a life of their own. Now, in addition, Manet's incredibly versatile and ambitious technique became visible. There are areas of rubbing with both dry cloths or a wet brush through wet paint. Sometimes he would be wiping the paint with solvent dampened rags, or sometimes you might see tamping into partially wet paint. Um, and by doing this, he would pull the rag away and you'd sort of get this sort of what looked like a, a sort of a pockmark texture. Um, sometimes we see evidence of scraping with a grattoir, um, which is like a knife and he would put this into fully dry paint, or sometimes he would also um, abrade the lower, um, abrade the paint so that he would expose the lower layer. Um, and then he would also sometimes partially cover it to draw attention to this ex exploitation of the paint layers. And all of this became evident while we were cleaning the picture. These abuses, if you want to call them that, um, produced very different textures, um, and this expanded the, the tonal range without actually needing to add any additional color. The artist manipulated the layers to enhance this effect, emphasizing what was underneath was equally as important to him as what was on top. Manet played with both thin paint as well as paint that came straight from the tube, and um, this also further ex, um, expanded the vocabulary of his stroke. Concurrent with the removal of the discolored varnish and working very closely with the late Philip Conisby and especially with Kimberly Jones, who's here today, we took advantage of the opportunity to study the development of the painting. Even before beginning the project, we knew that Manet had made some changes. And this was without even using x-rays or infrareds or anything else, because there were areas of pentamenti or alterations that were visible to the naked eye. Um, there was also impasto or thickly applied paint um, characterized by its texture covered by subsequent layers of paint. And this also then suggested that some of the original strokes had fully dried before Manet reworked those areas. Um, but beyond the naked eye, we really wanted to see underneath the, lay underneath the surface, and, and we took an X radiograph of the picture as well. And this really helped enormously in understanding the bigger picture and the changes have been made. Um, one area that we focused on was the little gar girl at the far left. Now, at far, she initially had her head in full profile, her forehead was exposed, and her hair was pulled back in a tight bun. The Manet had repositioned her nose, we think at least two or three times, um, and the gaze of her eyes was directed towards the um, little boy next to her. And originally, she was wearing shoes. And of course, once we see that in the x-ray, it also becomes very apparent, even to the naked eye, through the artist's intentional abrasion, um, that he, there was that change that he had made. And he could have covered this over, but I think he very consciously wanted to have the, the viewer be aware of it. Presenting her as a barefoot waif, now very much contrasted her with the other figures, of course, who are all wearing shoes. Um, and that, but then she was even more distanced and more detached from the group psychologically and spatially. Her costume, with all these changes, the costume was also altered. Um, her skirt was shorter. She wore a blouse with a white collar, and her vest was a later addition. And for all we know, there are even other changes. Um, but these were the ones that we were able to, to identify. Um, but in addition to the little girl, we started moving across the canvas. And um, what I want to continue doing is um, draw attention really to the artist's working method rather than pointing out um, just a list of changes and, and adjustments he made. Manet may have done preliminary drawings, um, but he didn't do um, really elaborate underdrawing in the traditional sense of the world, word. So we don't have drawings the way um, they exist for the Kayabat. We don't have underdrawing that one can see with infrared um, imaging that shows drawing underneath, because what I think was very common in the 19th century was that rather than 
drawing with charcoal or with um, pencil or some sort of uh, dry material, the artist would just go in with their brush, with their oil paint. Um, and then and they put the sketch in with that. And then, of course, that sort of gets absorbed um, into, into the final painting. But I do think that Manet um, worked out his composition of, um, on the canvas as the painting progressed. And, once, um, and we realized that one change then necessitates balance by something else. And that being said, the manipulation of the central figure, the subject of the narrative, the old musician, is probably less complex than the other figures. And that's because the, the artist conceived of his pose based on a drawing he did of a Roman sculpture at the Louvre. And I should add, this drawing is gridded, and we get very excited in conservation when we see a gridded drawing, because we assume it's been used for a transfer, and we might find a grid on the painting as well. We did not find a grid. Um, but that doesn't mean one didn't exist. Um, but um, we were, however, very curious about the figure next to the old musician. Um, clearly, he was related to the absinthe drinker in Copenhagen, as I mentioned earlier. This painting in, in, in Copenhagen is a life-size portrait. It's really not far in size from the, the two philosophers that hang here, if you want to get a sense of the scale. Um, it was painted four years earlier than the old musician. It was rejected from the official um, salon, and it sat in the artist's studio when he was working on the old musician. So you can imagine he's sort of seeing it next to him. So using very low-tech um, techniques, we tried something to get a better sense of the relationship of the Copenhagen painting and um, the National Gallery old musician. We laid a transparent sheet of mylar, um, which is sort of like heavy saran wrap, um, and we did an outline of our painting of the figure of the old, of, that looked similar, the man with the top hat. We did an outline on that. I carried it with me to Copenhagen, and they very um, generously allowed me to gently place it on top of their picture. And it was another one of these aha moments that we keep mentioning here. Um, they really did line up. So again, we knew there must have been some sort of transfer process, um, whether it was a tracing, a projection, a grid, um, a pouncing method. We're not sure. We don't have the evidence that was so obvious on the, um, the Kayabat. Or maybe it's there, and as I said, we haven't found it yet. Um, this insert of the top-hatted figure, though, um, sits rather awkwardly um, in the composition of the old musician. We find that he's not really sitting at all. He's not standing. He's sort of floating there. And I'm convinced that um, Manet recognized that there was an awkwardness in this figure. And he continued to work across the canvas towards, um, towards the edge precisely though, so that he could resolve the position and the role of, of this figure. So it appears that initially Manet conceived of the composition as a tight semicircle. Okay. This is what we think it started as. It was a semicircle of just the four figures and the baby. Um, the old musician um, was sitting there with this figures to the side and nothing is, is behind him. Um, we think that then Manet inserted the absinthe drinker, but he had to adjust the hat, which is rather interesting, um, so that it would fit into the painting and that pentamenti that you see at the top of the hat, um, right up here, that shape up there actually lines up with the, um, the hat in the Copenhagen picture, but I think that Manet felt that there wasn't enough space between the top of the painting and that, and so he changed it, but interestingly, it, it remains very, very visible to the viewer. Um, what he also um, 
changed was he eliminated the bottle um, and, and, the, um, and the glass that he had in the Copenhagen picture because um, they really didn't have a role in the, in the old musician. But we don't think it ever quite gelled. I mean, he did know about the old musician. I just wanted to point these, up, out, point these out because he's doing a series of drawings and sketches and prints, some before, some after. So this is a very, very important figure to him. And so in some ways it's not unusual. He wants to incorporate it, but it doesn't, it doesn't quite work for him. So I think then what he does, he adds another figure. And, um, this turban figure is known as the old Jew. Um, he's almost falling off the canvas, and I'm not sure that's because there wasn't enough space. I think this is a, something that Manet does in quite a number of his pictures. Um, but I'm absolutely certain that he added this figure to provide balance. It was literally and figuratively um, used to ground this hatted gentleman who was just still floating. But, um, the last two figures weren't added immediately. As I mentioned, there was dried impasto, um, which was underneath the top paint layers, and this suggested a continuation of the landscape that, in fact, um, must have gone underneath, continuously underneath here, and this is the impasto that we see that indicates that. Um, but what's also interesting is enough time had elapsed that that paint had actually dried. So it's not like Manet is making these changes within, within a few days. He's sort of living with these, these problems on his picture. Um, we also know, though, that um, looking at this caricature, which was um, done in 1863 after an exhibition, um, that the changes must have been done within a year from when he started the um, the, the canvas itself. But what's important to emphasize, however, is that Manet did not want to obscure the development of the, of the composition. He left clues all over the surface to draw attention to the changes. Um, in addition to the impasto and the pentimenti and the colors peeking through, the, as we see on the sleeve here, um, and what I love about it is it actually incorporates the brown of the, of the um, the garment of the gentleman next to him into the sleeve of the, of the old Jew. Um, but what we're also noticing is the way he painted these last two figures is very different from the first group. The old Jew is captured with a much brushier, looser application of paint. Um, and as I mentioned, it was about balance and the two final additions were inserted, I think to create a quarter circle to play off of the half circle of the, of the first four figures. So he's really figuring out how it all, all works, but he's figuring it out on the canvas and not through drawings. Now, further evidence of the evolution was provided by doing x-ray fluorescence, which is a, a non-destructive analytical technique which helps us identify pigments by isolating the, the elements. And this clarified the distinct campaigns of the painting. The primary white pigment that was used in the faces of the two figures on the right was identified as zinc white. And the flesh tones of the first four figures, however, were all painted in lead white. I should point out that both zinc white and lead white were available to artists at this period. It wasn't like all of a sudden zinc white was invented um, and he started using it. Artists would have both colors on their, their palettes. Um, they would choose them for different reasons, though. Now, of course, once we went back to the X-radiograph, um, it also became par apparent that um, they, these areas um, displayed diff very contrasting densities, referencing again the different radio-opaque characteristics of the two uh, pigments. It's much more difficult to penetrate lead white than it is zinc white. What became even more significant though, and we thought this was really great, was that zinc white was also used in the nape of the little girl's neck and in her feet. These are both areas, remember, that we know from the x-radiograph were areas of change. So this makes it very clear that Manet must have gone back to the little girl and rethought her position in this group at the same time that he added the two figures. 
Um, and again, I keep repeating this, but I think this was all for balance. Now, Manet may have wanted his technique to appear effortless, but the examination of this painting has revealed that the layering um, is really complex, and you can see that the reworking is very extensive. Even the signature on this picture is painted with two different colors. It's black and blue layered one over the other. Um, and throughout, Manet left evidence of the changes. I'm convinced this was characteristic of artists um, who are equally as committed to printmaking as painting, um, because in a print, all of the stages remain as existing states, of course, but in a painting, it's only the x-ray or the infrared um, that allow us to see what's underneath. So I think that the clues Manet leaves remain visible, visible because he explicitly chooses not to, to obscure them. Then I, I want to leave you with just one additional detail about the development of this work, um, which tells us even more about Manet's interest in the process of creating works of art. There's a particularly unusual colored drawing, which some of the curators may know that keeps reappearing on the market. Um, it's obviously related to the composition, but it doesn't quite have the liveliness or the spontaneity of a sketch, and we kept wondering um, how it fit into the, the development of the painting. It's very stiff. Um, there's sort of a calculated nature to the strokes, and we, um, actually believe there's probably a tracing for or from something. Um, but at what stage it was used, we really um, weren't certain. So again, we looked at the related sources. Um, and I looked at um, these photographs that were um, done by um, a photographer in Paris named Godet, who um, photographed Manet's paintings while they were still in his studio. And um, I realized that the contours of the original photograph and those of the drawing lined up perfectly. Again, I, I love this low tech technique. Again, we took a, a mylar overlay. Um, we placed it over the um, photograph at the Morgan Library, and it lined up absolutely perfectly. And even what happens is the edges confirmed um, that this must have been the trick um, he was doing. But then the question is, why did, why did Manet do this? We actually are beginning to think that this was made in preparation for a color print or a color lithograph um, that was supposed to be struck after the painting um, was done and then it was never made. We don't have this, this print, but we do have prints of the little girl and the drinker, which we do know were made after the painting. Not, they're not preliminary um, images. Um, but in fact, we never had the, um, uh, the overall print of, of the old musician. I think that this is a really wonderful find. We were delighted to, to see it. But it's a tool. This, um, the drawing that I just showed you is, um, it's not really a work of art, but for the conservator and the art historian, it's a very valuable reference to help recognize how the artist's mind worked. It provides another link to understanding that for Manet, one change precipitated another. It was not about individual changes. In addition to more fully appreciating the creative process and the complexity of Manet's working method, I hope that this presentation draws attention to the need to use various resources and various analytical techniques. And I think you've been hearing um, today and, and, and yesterday as well, this necessity to work in tandem with our colleagues. An x-ray or an infrared image alone can only tell us a certain amount about a painting and can easily be misinterpreted. But I find that dovetailing all of these various tools, relying heavily on the naked eye um, and having the art historian working alongside the conservator allows us to understand the context locate the relevant sources, and emerge with a much more fuller, much fuller understanding of the artist's work. Thank you. Do you want me to take questions? Hmm? Or not. George.
All right, next I would like to welcome Ella Hendricks to the podium. Ella is a senior paintings conservator at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. She's been an important resource and collaborator in the study of Van Gogh for many recent projects. In 2006, she earned a PhD at the University of Amsterdam for her studies on Van Gogh's working methods. And in 2011, she co-authored the new catalog of Van Gogh's Antwerp and Paris paintings in the Van Gogh Museum collection. She is also Associate Professor for Conservation and Restoration at the University of Amsterdam. So welcome, Ella. So thank you, Jill, for that uh, introduction. Um, so I'm going into my second talk on uh, Van Gogh. Uh, I should talk about Matisse and surprise everybody, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Um, so I'd like to start my talk by taking you back to May 2013 and the opening of the exhibition Van Gogh at Work, which was held at the Van Gogh Museum, and it was scheduled to coincide with the reopening of the exhibition after seven months of renovation. And as you can see here, it was very busy as usual. And the exhibition presented the outcome of an ambitious eight-year program of interdisciplinary research into the studio practice of the artist. The research involved an intense interdisciplinary collaboration between art historians, scientists, and conservators. And I show just a few of my colleagues here, particularly from uh, Shell Research, who was our partner in science at the time, and our colleagues at the, the Netherlands Institute, I have to read this, the Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands, otherwise known as RCE. And I'd like to acknowledge the importance of their collaboration for the content of my talk. So every day, an average of four, four and a half thousand visitors pass through the exhibition, which was held throughout the main building. And the audience ranged from fast-tracking backpackers wanting a quick encounter with Van Gogh to those seeking more in-depth information. This presented quite a challenge. But we hope to offer something new to both groups, encouraging the visitor to examine Van Gogh's work and life from a different angle, as if looking over the shoulder of the artist while at work, as it were. And through a combination of analog and digital interactives, we invited visitors to explore key themes uh, of the exhibition in a hands-on way, in an interactive learning approach that was positively reviewed. And I'll show you just two examples. Unusually, we encourage visitors to explore the tactile properties of Van Gogh's paint surfaces, to actually touch things, uh, obviously not the originals, but by feeling high-quality reproductions. And visitors were surprisingly reluctant to do so, which was interesting. They're very well trained. And we invited them to peer through research microscopes, just as conservators and scientists do, and find for themselves, for example, grains of sand embedded in the paint of a seascape made on the beach. Top left, we see the original painting, and underneath a detail, uh, photographed by my colleague Katrin Piltz, of the, the sand grains which were swept into the paint by use of the palette knife and the brush. And on the right, a small reproduction by the students at the conservation training program where visitors could actually look through the microscope and, as it were, follow the sequence and direction of brush marks uh, by the way that the, the sand had been swept out. Now, importantly, the exhibition laid to rest the popular notion of Van Gogh as an impassioned genius who set to work in an intuitive, even savage manner without any prior plan, and I'm sure uh, that you're very familiar with Kirk Douglas's portrayal of the artist in this way in the film Lust of Life. Here he's shown as, a, as he's about to attack the canvas with his brush, note the claw-like hand and the paint spilling over the edges of his palette. In fact, uh, perhaps slightly sadly, as the exhibition showed, careful study of Van Gogh's letters and works has revealed a self-conscious approach towards his own development as an artist and that he pursued his goals in a calculated, sometimes even programmatic way. Similarly, he was knowledgeable on technical matters. He didn't simply use whatever was at hand. And he purposely experimented with different materials and techniques throughout his career in search of particular effects. And I'm going to demonstrate this fact by briefly considering just two of the six educational themes in the exhibition, 
relating to different aspects of his working practice. I won't talk about colour and colour change, since I did that yesterday. Um, so I'll, to I'll focus on materials and equipment, in particular the perspective frame, and on recycled paintings. So this is the section in the exhibition on the perspective frame. And for those of you who've seen the exhibition here, I just uh, saw that there's a very nice uh, reproduction of the perspective, perspective frame uh, in the bedroom exhibition too. But for those of you who've not yet seen it, it might come as a surprise that an artist whose work can look as if spontaneously dashed off in a second and made frequent use of this traditional aid to help render correct proportions and sketch out his drawings and paintings. And he had no natural feeling for perspective and the relative scale of things, and used the device from early on in his career as a learning aid, which he recommends to a colleague painter, Anton Kersme Marcus. And he, he suggested he's willing to pop over for the day and show him how to use the frame. For as he put it, there's nothing like it for teaching one to look and teaching one to feel perspective. The device goes back to Albrecht Dürer's invention in, in 1525, uh, and the illustration at the top shows how it works. So the artist looks through the frame at his motif, in this case uh, a reclining nude, and the wires or strings stretched across the frame help the artist to translate the uh, service reference points to translate the proportions of the figure, in this case, in correct proportions onto the flat surface of his panel uh, or paper. And for it to work well, it was important to, to keep the eye, of the, the, the eye at the same level with the subject when looking through the frame. Now, Vakhoch seems to illustrate the same principle. I think if you look carefully at the sketch underneath, you can distinguish an artist seated looking through a frame uh, with a with a canvas or drawing sheet on his lap, and he's looking through the frame at a distant landscape with a strolling figure. And the frame has a simple cross, uh, much as the frame illustrated in Cassania's handbook on watercolour painting, which we know that Vakhoch had read. Vakhoch's earliest perspective frames were strung with filaments in a simple grid formation, and top right, we see a reconstruction of the earliest one with the filaments at three centimeter intervals. And it's this grid um, which we see tracings of that begin to appear in his drawings from March 1882 onwards. And here I've just strengthened the ends of the pencil lines which are traced from the grid uh, to help you locate them. But he's used it very effectively con to construct the strong foreshortening of the chair and the woman's pose, who is actually seen, who is his sweetheart uh, at the time. In August 1882, he wrote, he wrote about and drew a new perspective frame that he'd had made by the local blacksmith. And rather than a, a straightforward grid, it now had a cross with diagonals. And coming from Britain, I called it a Union Jack configuration. Um, the frame could be mounted in a, in a landscape or portrait direction on poles anchored in the ground. And you could adjust the height using pegs, so you could use it level um, when working on uneven terrain as he illustrates here, working on the beach at Skaveninger, which is close to The Hague. And we find traced lines from a perspective frame of this type, often, in his, particularly in his Paris landscape paintings. This is a very clear example. Uh, he's traced it onto the middle of the canvas, but despite using the frame, we're actually looking up the sloping hill of Montmartre, and he's, made to, he's managed to make it look remarkably flat. In 1885, he sketched different types of perspective frames, including a variant that you could adjust in height with a single screw that would have been uh, suitable for working indoors. That's the second from left. And it's probably this type of frame that he used when capturing the view through the window of the brother's apartment in the Ruler Peak, where he lived with his brother Theo. And um, this is the photo, the view through the window. You can see it's changed very little. It's, it's actually photographed through the third on the third floor, um, we now know that the, the brother's apartment was, on, was actually on the fourth floor. Uh, that's quite a recent discovery. But it's pretty much the same, except there are some new buildings blocking off the distant view. And here, in this infrared image on the right, you can see he simply placed it in the middle of the canvas and traced around it with the threads crossed at a distant feature on the horizon, which is the Trocadero Palace. 
In February 88, Fakoch moved on to Arles, where he soon afterwards embarked on a series of drawings, both small ones and a few larger ones, um, which he described like Japanese woodcuts. And he wanted to use them as a basis for making Japanese-style paintings. So I show some examples here, the drawings on the left and the paintings that followed on the right. And detailed technical examination has revealed that the relationship between the drawing and the painting can differ in each case. In every case, uh, there were traced pencil lines revealing from a pers the use of a perspective frame for the drawings which were evidently made out of doors, certainly for the top three which are in our collection. But no traces of um, traced lines from a perspective frame on the actual canvases used for the paintings on the right with one exception, and that's the painting in the Walworth Ricketts Museum, which is shown at the bottom. And this is the, on, uh, the image is actually a, a reconstruction of the trace lines of the perspective frame that is shown on the, the fantastic website on the techniques of impressionist and post-impressionist painters uh, linked to the museum, which my colleague Iris Schaefer showed yesterday in her talk. And this still remains, we're still looking, but this is still the, the last known example of a painting where we do find evidence for use of a perspective frame, which could perhaps be anticipated, since in this letter written in June, that's uh, early June in the following month, he explains that he no longer needs to use it, since he proudly announces that this drawing of fishing boats made early in the morning was completed in less than an hour, which he underlines, without the help of a, of a frame. Although he dispensed, apparently, with the frame in the paintings, they still show a very detailed preparatory sketch made using the same pencil and or ink media as used for the drawings. And thanks to Catherine Piltz for this image, if we zoom in, we can see, in this particular case, he's used ink. We see ink lines used to, to draw the roof. You can see the drips of ink running down the canvas. So the same ink was, as was used for the preceding drawing. So there's both an influence in style, but also in technique, a sort of cross-influence between drawing and painting in this period. For this picture on the right, which I recently uh, treated, a larger drawing was used, which was trimmed on two sides. So the uh, proportions of the drawing sheet anticipated the proportions of the canvas on which he would make the painting. In this case, infrared revealed a, a really detailed uh, pencil on the drawing of all the contours of the trees and the buildings along the horizon. Uh, and we know that he still had the drawing at hand as he'd not yet sent it off to Teo. I've indicated some of the straighter lines which cut across the composition, more schematic lines, but it's hard to distinguish the, the contour lines around the trees and the buildings from the painted Prussian blue contour lines on top. In March 2015, uh, John Delaney visited from the National Gallery in Washington with his hyperspectral infrared uh, camera. And in false color near infrared, these techniques have already been explained uh, in the previous um, lectures, we can separate, separate out these different materials of pencil and blue paint since they respond differently in the infrared region. So the pencil lines are dark gray and the, the blue lines, the painted lines, are now red. So we can start to separate the two and see small shifts between them as he worked up the painting. And if we zoom in at this detail, we can actually see this on the painting at under high magnification. You can see the pencil lines within the contours uh, of the blue lines that followed. So just these few examples illustrate Van Gogh's careful, very careful preparation of his pictures, uh, often sketching out his compositions in considerable detail so as to speed up the painting process that, that followed, and therefore allowing for a spontaneous uh, look in the finished result. So. Switching to the second theme, uh, which is recycled canvases, this was the, the section of the, the exhibition. Um, we, Technical examinations have revealed that Fakoch very, very often overpainted existing works, particularly in the period 1884 to 87, out of economic necessity. I mean, we knew uh, at that time in 2014, actually these figures are from uh, 63 examples, and I think it's even gone up, up a bit since that date. 
However, the situation changed when he moved to Arles and he started to order his materials through his brother Theo, who also paid for them, so we have fewer examples from the later period of his career. And what I want to show you is that he changed his method of recycling canvases over time uh, in a deliberate way. So at first he simply painted a new scene directly on top of the old one, as this um, example of a Noonan picture illustrates. In fact, in this case, he's used the canvas twice, turning it each time. So if we turn it 90 degrees, the exo reveals a composition of a woman spinning a winding yarn. And if we turn it upside down, we have a composition of a shepherd with his, with his flock and a dog. And this way of simply painting directly on top of existing works continued uh, up into the autumn of 86. And here we have another example. Um, this is an unusually large still life in the Kuala Museum in Otolo. And in fact, at some point, the picture was dismissed uh, as a Van Gogh painting, but it was reinstated in 2012, partly based on the investigation of the underlying composition. Uh, as a go on to show, and this is the team of uh, researchers that were involved. It's quite unusual to get all these people from different institutions together, uh, from the University of Antwerp, Van Gogh Museum, uh, Kuala Mulu Museum, and uh, the Technical University in Delft, and this also was published as a paper in Van Gogh Museum Studies. An X-ray of the painting made in 1988 had revealed that the still life is painted on top of a depiction of two wrestling men, as you can see here, but it's quite difficult to read. However, in uh, 2012, macro scanning X ray fluorescence spectrometry, so an X ray based technique, um, was performed by Geert van der Snicht, and it has already been explained. This enables us to identify the, ele the elements present in the various paint layers and to assign these to pigments. So we can sort of map the colors used in different layers of the painting, which obviously requires some interpretation. And performing this uh, method from the back of the painting, this is the scan of the element zinc, which is present in zinc white, which has been abundantly used in the underlying composition. And it provided a much uh, clearer image of the two the two wrestlers, which can now undoubtedly be identified as what uh, Van Gogh described as the large thing with two naked torsos, two wrestlers that Van Gogh mentioned in his letters he had painted at the academy in Antwerp. And what you'll note is that we can now see that they're wearing loincloths, um, which is characteristic of the more conservative academy in Antwerp as opposed to in Brussels and Paris, for example. And he, indeed, he refers to two naked torsos. That's very uh, explicit. And Van Gogh's typically direct way of painting, so also the style of the painting, uh, is evident in the firm and linear brushwork used to sketch the figures, quite comparable to his earlier Noonan pictures, which was re revealed by raking light inspection of the loincloths, for example. You can see in the top left an image of light sk uh, skimming along the surface. So you can see the very straight uh, direct brush strokes of the loincloths, which have been traced in the top right using one of these uh, tracings that Anne uh, has shown many examples of. However, an important change in Van Gogh's way of reusing canvases took place towards the end of 1886, and I'll show you this example to illustrate that. Uh, on the right, you see the X-ray. It's very hard to read. It shows a, uh, a study of a female bust portrait with long hair, and the reason it's hard to read is because Van Gogh has now started to scrape it down uh, rather irregularly, so just the thicker passages of paint, and then covered it up with a loosely brushed layer of lead white paint, which is that milky layer that you see. To gain more information on the build-up and composition uh, of the paint layers, a tiny paint sample was taken, and uh, many of you probably uh, know what this entails, but just to illustrate this, um, see top left my colleague uh, Muriel Geldof, who's removing a sample from the edge of a painting, uh, from, or from the edge of a damage, and to give you some idea of the scale of the paint sample, the, the top centre image next to a paper clip. And when this is enlarged, you begin to see the different layers, and bottom left you can see the dark specks, which is actually the sample embedded in a, in a resin block, which is then ground and polished on one side, 
and examined with the microscope to get this type of image shown at the top. So what we see are the layers of the first painting, and then I've um, pointed out in yellow letters, this is the, the white covering layer which covers up the first picture, which I've called the new white ground, and then the paint layers of the self-portrait on top. And if we focus on this covering white layer, we see it even higher magnification in the, uh, with a scanning electron microscope at the bottom, you can see these huge chunks of a mineral barium sulfate poking out of the paint layer, which reveals that Van Gogh used a particularly cheap type of lead white uh, mixed with barium sulfate. And you can imagine that this would give a sort of gritty texture with these particles sticking out of the paint. And turning back to the painting, uh, we can see the effect, the combined effect of this gritty paint and the rough scraping down and loose covering up uh, and this very roughly textured paint surface, here photographed again in raking light. And this seems to be an effect that Van Gogh actually enjoyed, uh, since he paints using a very rough painting technique uh, in other canvases of the period that are not reused. For example, in this still life, I show you the raking light image on the right that, make, uh, that makes it easier to appreciate the, the dashing use of impasto brushwork. You can see this very choppy uh, use of brushwork very rapidly executed, providing a richly modelled paint surface. So he's really painting and enjoying the thick texture of the paint. However, a sudden switch in his way of recycling canvases took place in the spring of 87, uh, at which time he adopted a very thin way of painting, it's almost like watercolour, uh, with delicate dots and touches of colour applied onto a light ground, as exemplified by this picture. Uh, there's another version of this picture in the exhibition, the second version, uh, which shows again the view from the brother's window in the Ruler Peak. So he now begins to carefully, very carefully scrape down uh, the paint underneath and to cover the first composition with a very smooth layer before painting a new work on top. And this means it becomes almost impossible to read the x-rays. You can see on the right, uh, perhaps once you know it, you can distinguish, I think it's a portrait of a bearded man, or possibly a self-portrait, but because it's radically scraped down, you can hardly uh, distinguish it. And now he's covered up the underlying um, image with this smooth, cool white layer consisting of lead white, zinc white, with a little bit of blue pigment, probably a, uh, which corresponds to a mixture sold as foundation white, so you could buy it as a ready-made paint, which would give a cool, reflective surface on which to apply these very thin dots and streaks of colour. And if we look at the, at the very top of the sample, you can see a very thin uh, red layer, which is, which is actually the current painting. So it's really like a watercolour, exploiting the luminosity of the, the light ground underneath. And you can imagine in the painting, here you see this cool white layer showing through all over the place, um, but its smooth surface does not interfere with the delicate touches on top. Now, from the summer of 87, so just later that year, he starts to cover up pictures with coloured layers instead of using white ones. Here, using a, a brownish pink colour, which has been left showing uh, for the shaded areas in the foreground in particular, so it enabled him to paint very quickly uh, in this, for this uh, wooded landscape, for example, because you could leave large passages exposed. It served as a middle tone on which to build up the darks and the lights. And sample analysis, that's the middle layer here, revealed that the warm colour contains a very specific mixture of eight pigments. That's almost like a fingerprint uh, for the paint. And indeed, this same, very same mixture, this very same ground colour, has been found on uh, quite a few other works by Van Gogh, including this work, uh, a self-portrait in the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum, which um, the attribution to Van Gogh was recently, or a few years ago, was re reinstated as a Van Gogh painting. Um, it was examined by Stefan Kornhauser, and one of the pieces of evidence was the fact that the paint used for the ground layer was of exactly the same kind, with exactly the same uh, mixture and characteristic pigments. But it also occurs on the back of at least 11 Noonan period canvases, eight of which he, he reused when he moved to Paris uh, in the in the summer of 87. So I show this one first. This is actually the back of a Noonan work, and I show it because the loose canvas was in a sort of clamp frame to hold it while painting. Uh, so he, the edges are left uncolored. 
And these are the other works where it occurs. So at the top, we see the Noonan picture that he sent to Paris, and at the bottom, the French pictures that he painted on the back side, on top of this uh, pinkish layer. And this idea of painting works on the backs of existing canvases had, of course, the advantage of preserving the first work. He's not covering it up. Uh, so it might suggest that he, had, he attached more value to the works painted on the back than to the ones he covered up, even though these were first and foremost studies intended for his own use in the studio. But from these observations, we can surmise that in Paris, recycling had become such a routine feature of Van Gogh's work and procedure that he thought ahead and prepared several supports for reuse in one go. And this is yet another example of his systematic and well-considered approach to achieve a particular result. So in a broader sense, with these few examples, I hope to demonstrate uh, of how looking at Van Gogh's paintings through a lens, and very tiny details sometimes, uh, can provide a new understanding of the artist's goals and working methods. I'd like to thank you for listening and acknowledge uh, the input of all these colleagues at different institutions uh, contributing towards this work. Thank you. We can take a couple of questions for Ella, uh, but we will return to using the floor mic. Um, it's less expedient, but it helps people hear things better. Maybe I explained things very clearly. clearly. <laughs> I have a very quick question. Is the clamp frame that you mentioned, yeah. do you know? What do you know about it? Um, well, there were uh, types of, of advertised actually for sale. They were called Stirrate, um, with the Dutch pronunciation. And they were advertised, for example, in Cassania's uh, handbook, um, which he'd actually read. So you had two different types. Maybe Pascal Labroche Le would know much more. But you had two different types, some with pins around the edges. And sometimes we'd find actually little holes around the edges of the canvases that provide evidence of it having been clamped in this frame. Um, and it's also thought that he used it to hold some of his drawing sheets, and not just canvases, but also drawing sheets. Um, we don't know if his was commercially purchased or that he made it himself, but it was something that was available for artists to use. I'm sure we'll be returning to Van Gogh um, in the conversation, so that's uh, not, not over yet. Um, I'd like to invite our final speaker of the day to the podium now, um, Dario Gamboni. Um, Dario is the professor of art history at the University of Geneva. His publications include The Destruction of Art, Iconoclasm and Vandalism Since the French Revolution of 1997, Potential Images, Ambiguity, and Indeterminacy in Modern Art from 2002, The Brush and the Pen, Odilon Redon and Literature from 1989 and 2011, and most recently, Paul Gauguin, The Mysterious Center of Thought, um, 2014. He's a collaborator on our upcoming Paul Gauguin exhibition and on the printed catalog and online publication that will accompany it. So please join me in welcoming Dario. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you for the invitation. Uh, to come back to winter, I have a cold, but to uh, find back also many friends, discover the wonderful exhibition on uh, Van Gogh's uh, bedrooms and in the museum. Um, reconstructing Paul Gauguin's uh, Crucible. In 1891, the, oh yes, Wait a minute, where does that happen? Where do I move the... Um, uh, 
Where is that? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Is is that the thing here? What what is that? Oh, this thing here. Okay. Very good. Yes, I had bought one. Very good. Thank you. Great. So, <clears throat> in um, 1891, the French writer and art critic Jean Dolan contrasted his friend Paul Gauguin with the neo-impressionists, whose claim to basing their art on the objective nature of reality and of human perception, he mocked by calling them, by calling the neo-impressionists, I quote, scientists who decompose light, artists whose studio is a laboratory. Ah, the scholars of that department of knowledge, physicists, chemists, end of quote. According to Dolan, the basis of Gauguin's art, by contrast, was subjective and interior. I quote, le creuset de Gauguin est le cerveau. Gauguin's crucible is the brain. And what I've been showing to you is on the right, uh, a wonderful self-portrait study by Gauguin of 1899, in which one can uh, imagine that the repetition of the eye uh, where the forehead of the main figure is suggests a eye of the mind. And on the left, the famous draft of Georges Seurat's letter to Maurice Beaubourg of 1890, in which, for instance, he uh, made reference to the phenomena of the uh, <coughs> duration of the uh, luminous impression on the retina. Now, <clears throat> the image of the crucible evokes indeed less the chemist than the alchemist, as for instance represented in Joseph Wright of Derby's The Alchemist in Search of the Philosopher's Stone of 1771. So the alchemist does work on matter, on materials, but his aim is spiritual and uh, he aims at it at a transubstantiation and which is, or according to some at least, an image also and a tool for an inner transformation. Now, does that uh, statement by Dolan, uh, Gauguin's crucible is the brain, do justice to Gauguin's own ideas and aims? Indeed, Gauguin liked the article. He copied it and he pasted it in one of his manuscripts. And the notion that art would be, to quote Leonardo, a cosa mentale, a thing of the mind, is an idea that he expressed himself in various ways uh, on various occasions. For instance, in his later assertion that, I quote, the Impressionists focus their efforts around the eye, not in the mysterious center of thought, and from there they slipped into scientific reasons, end of quote. Now the crucible, the image of the crucible also suggests a great heat in which the ingredients employed lose their previous identity and merge into a new entity. Much like in the uh, celebrated, although currently disputed it seems, metaphor of the American melting pot, of which I show you a, a wonderful on the right um, depiction as a photo montage by the German artist John Hartfield in 1946, a reminder of older, older uh, times. Um, <clears throat> Gauguin used similar metaphors for creativity, uh, the volcano, for instance, and the potter's kiln. And he advised his fellow artists not to finish work too much, because that would mean, I quote, to let the lava grow cool and to turn boiling blood into stone. Though it were a ruby, fling it far from you." End of quote. So should we conclude uh, from these, uh, these quotes that Gauguin was, and that Gauguin's studies should be, adverse to science and the laboratory? Would it mean that our search for his ingredients and processes, uh, uh, we would be searching for ingredients that that sheer transformation has made irrelevant? Well, I would say no, um, <clears throat> because um, he did speak of the mysterious center of thought, and I, which I think that's what he was searching for, but um, he was not after something like the often misleading notion of conceptual art. And he also asked for, I quote, intelligent hands. So it was not the mind versus uh, 
the making versus the hands. And on the left, we see these uh, photographs of Paul Gauguin's hand and a bit of his face by the, another art critic, Julien Leclerc, in the 1890s. His art, in fact, results from that interaction between eye, mind, and hand, which has been celebrated by various authors like Henri Fossillon in his Eloge de la Main, Praise of the Hand, more recently by Richard Sennett. And I think that it is this fact also that contributes to its fascination or the fascination of its results in our times of artistic allography, that is, in which many artists uh, currently uh, delegate or routinely delegate the execution of their works to fabricators. And I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm just saying that this changes the way that we look at and possibly also appreciate works which were done in different ways. And as a witness to this, uh, <coughs> I show you one of Gauguin's early carvings. It is the, uh, the work Woman Out Walking of around 1880. Uh, carved in a tropical laurel wood. Uh, and on the left, this uh, wonderful drawing by Camille Pissarro, showing Gauguin in the act of uh, carving that work. And I think the drawing very well conveys the sort of sense of intimacy and of direct physical interaction between artist, material, uh, hand, eye, and of course, mind. Gauguin was a truly experimental artist, not so much in the sense of Claude Bernard's introduction to the experimental method, that is in the sense of instrumental rationality, of uh, planification, quantifying, and repetition, more in the sense of what uh, Claude Bernard, the biologist, actually did, as his laboratory diary reveals, and as was shown by the great uh, science historian uh, Hans-Jörg Reinberger, that is not so much planning and going exactly where he wanted to go, but actually in a complicated, windy process informed by serendipity and opportunism, leaving a track for another one which he had not expected, but actually uh, came out and, and uh, was more promising. Caught in chance, and I would say and here I, I use notions introduced by the British anthropologist Alfred Gell in his 1997 book Art and Agency. I would say that Gauguin, like Bernard and many others, artists and scientists, was sharing artistic agency with uh, other agents, including the physical ingredients of the creative process, including, for instance, so-called found objects. So this uh, drinks, uh, drinks dispenser, which is in the collection of the Musée d'Orsay and dates around 1889. The main part is a, uh, an anonymous uh, folk uh, ceramics that Gauguin purchased, probably, and to which, however, he added uh, a base and a top that he carved uh, himself. So the main part he found but selected, and he complemented uh, <coughs> it. Gauguin uh, reinvented techniques in all media and across media, and this is something that we'll try and show uh, in the exhibition in preparation at, uh, in this museum at the Musée d'Orsay, Gauguin artist as, as alchemist. Um, the justification for this delegation of agency uh, is the fact, or one of them, is the fact that he saw materials not as inert matter, but rather as possessing specific properties that the artist had to understand and interpret and exploit. In the passage on intelligent hands that I mentioned, which was about ceramics, um, he suggested to replace, I quote, the potter at his wheel by intelligent hands which could impart the life of a figure to a vase and yet remain true to the character of the material, end of quote. In this case, which is the wonderful vase in the form of Lida and the Swan of 1887-1888 in a Chicago private uh, collection. Um, the material is stoneware, and we see some of that grain in many parts, uh, the unglazed parts, but on the other hand, uh, it is clear the life of a figure indeed has been imparted uh, to, to the vase. 
As much, uh, therefore, as an alchemist, Gauguin can be described as a bricoleur, a tinkerer, in the sense that has been given to the word by Claude Lévi-Strauss in La Pensée Sauvage, Wild Thought, when he observed that the handyman's means, the tinkerer's means, I quote, each represent a set of actual and possible relations, but do not on that account have one definite and determinate use. Therefore, what we call recycling, repurposing, also mean using on purpose materials that are already to some extent preformed and therefore will constrain but also stimulate uh, invention. This makes retracing the genesis of Gauguin's works essential to their understanding since uh, so, much is, is, uh, so much of them is bound to the process rather than deriving from a preconceived uh, project. And to some extent, I was thinking, without wanting to open the Pandora's box of interpretation after Anne Hugiswald's uh, paper on, on Manet's old musician, but of course you wonder if, if so much of the composition comes in the process of painting, what does this mean about semantics also? Um, so this means that what we have to study is very much, or maybe the way we can reframe uh, art history or uh, complement it is what Valéry, Paul Valéry in the 1930s uh, called poietic and asked for a poietic, poietics that is the study of poiesis, the study of the work of art, not as a finite, as a definite result, but as a making, as a process. Um, this is something that has been done, and for instance, in literary studies, there is a whole brand of research which has started in France, by the way, and called uh, analyse genetique, genetical an analysis, and which has tended to replace the authoritative published version of a text in favor of the interpretation and the analysis and interpretation of its various stages, of the anti-text, as the authors uh, of that genre are called. Art history, of course, has been doing this for a long time, uh, looking at sketches and at studies. But in the case of a work of art, a lot of the equivalent of the anti-text is within the final work, is subsumed in the final work. And it needs very close observation and material analysis to find it back, to retrace it, to find its traces within uh, the appearance of the final work. And therefore, it calls for a, a collaboration between art historians, conservators, and materials, uh, material scientists. So, um, for instance, if you look at the vase in the form of, of Lida, here I show, and thanks to the <coughs> Art Institute of Chicago, an X-ray photograph showing on the left uh, the lighter horizontal lines of joints between bands of clay, which shows that it was a, a, a so-called slab construction uh, by which he created the vase. And on the right, we have an X-ray computed uh, uh, tomography slice showing the construction of the vase with the attachment on, of the leg on the right over, over the plate and the, wall, and the wall of the vessel. And then the formation of the, uh, the head of the uh, goose swan here uh, at the upper right and the addition of the nose here on the left. So we can uh, go beyond what we can see with the naked eye, uh, and it's very rare actually that one can really take a very close look at these objects, but we can really try and reconstruct the way they were, <coughs> they were made. Now, I have had the privilege of having enjoyed such a dialogue with the Art Institute of Chicago for, for many years, and especially with the departments of prints and drawings. For instance, for an article uh, that was published in 2007 in the Art Bulletin, in which I elaborated on a discovery made in 1976 in this house by Susan Folds McCullough and Inga Christine Swenson, the discovery of a direct link existing between two lithographs published in 1891 by Odilon Redon, a very rare uh, <coughs> state of Parsifal on the left and Druides uh, on, on the right. Uh, and maybe you see better that they are indeed genetically connected. If I put uh, Parsifal upside down, you may observe that there are many uh, similarities. And, and there's been a process of transfer between the two. But it is out of this version of Parsifal that Redon made, actually, the druides, and then shortened the composition, as you see on the side. 
So in my article, I, in, in my analysis, I try to explore the cultural and artistic implications of this metamorphosis. But among other things, I reach, uh, thanks to a very close observation in the prints and drawings and uh, conservation department here, and with the help of Harriet Sweet, is that the conclusion that at least there was at least one step more. That is, if one takes a very close look at uh, the first version of Parsifal upside down and compares it with Druides, one sees that actually the eye of Druides was already there. So this was not the point of departure. There was already something before, and with a, I suppose, in the meanwhile, relatively low tech um, technique, Karin Patzker, who was then working there, uh, made this uh, a very nice combination of details of the two works on top of each other, slightly shifted, one in orange and the other one in uh, purple, and this is not a recolorization, I should make clear, um, we could understand and verify that indeed the eye had already been there, which was quite a, a small but most interesting discovery about this shifting, this oscillation between genders and many other things in this uh, lithographic metamorphosis. Uh, Gauguin and Redon um, uh, shared a mutual respect and, and admiration. Um, maybe I should go back. I will come back to that. Um, with Gauguin too, like Redon, like Degas, maybe like Manet, um, liked to repeat, adapt, assemble, reassemble motifs, compositions. But what may appear at first sight as a form of recycling was really also a way of generating variety, prompting invention, and, and uh, creating meaning. Especially in the case, it, this is especially the case with works on paper, thanks to the possibilities of repetition and variation that printmaking offer with transfer, proof, counterproof, uh, etc. Now, the Art Institute in general and the Department of Prints and Drawings in particular have a long history of collecting and studying these objects and processes. And here comes my, <coughs> I also bring uh, f f portraits of colleagues, as you see here. Um, so, which have resulted, among other things, in uh, major publications uh, and even uh, milestones publications, such as the catalogue The Art of Paul Gauguin in 1988, edited by Richard Bretel, Van Gogh and Gauguin, The Studio of the South in 2001 by uh, Douglas Drake and Peter Ziegers with Britt Salveson. Articles such as Chris, Christy Dams, Paul Gauguin's paintings on paper, infrared investigations, and their implications for three works from the Art Institute of Chicago Collection, 2004, and especially maybe the wonderful article by Peter Court Ziegers in the kitchen with Paul Gauguin devising recipes for a symbolist graphic aesthetic, published in the collection of essays edited by Harriet Stratis and Britt Salveson, the broad spectrum studies in the material techniques and conservation of works on paper. So I think also that this continuous effort, this cumulative effort is extremely important, even in terms of institutional memory. And therefore, this is why I make my own small collage. On the left, we see Harriet uh, holding the fo a photograph which hangs in the prints and drawings department of Karl O. Schneewin, which was then uh, um, head of prints and drawings, holding himself a a, a colored drawing by uh, Gauguin in the collection on the back of which had been discovered another drawing. And the funny thing is that this is a mirror, actually. Each one sees the uh, recto, and this is the verso. And so it could go on like that. I suppose it should go on, absolutely. Um, so the, uh, a recent uh, and wonderful opportunity for a systematic look into Gauguin's works in the collection and including on paper to which I, I uh, was uh, <coughs> privileged to collaborate is the new catalog of Gauguin holdings in the collection in the context of the online scholarly catalog initiative. So I can't wait for it to be on the air. I understand this should be by early, early summer. And what I will now do is only present a few findings, a very few things actually, and things that I have learned from dialoguing, especially with Harriet Stratis, on, and especially on the woodcuts of the Noah Noah Suite. But again, this can give no idea of the richness and the, the complexity, actually what I would call the polyphony of what will be the website, in which there will be, on some works, three different entries and a lot of material and uh, an extraordinary wealth of photographs, etc. Well, you will see that. So, again, just a few examples. Um, <coughs> first, 
something that should be obvious but that we tend to forget is that the current appearance of a work of art is not necessarily the way it originally looked when it left the artist's hands, uh, studio, etc. And so even a, such a colorful work as this uh, version in pink and ink and brush and watercolor on, on paper of Pape Moy, uh, the source of 1893-94, uh, has lost uh, a lot of its, of its color. Uh, however, if I may, uh, this is a slight comment and maybe an introduction to our future discussion, but uh, on what we have heard and discussed, I think that this should by no means disqualify the work which now exists and to which we can have an immediate sensory uh, access. We should certainly did not disqualify this work and replace it as the work of art that interests us in favor of a virtual artifact such as a recolorization. They can complement our understanding of it, certainly, but they should by no means replace it. Now, moving to woodcuts. Um, a close examination of, of the woodblocks, which, a bit surprisingly for the Noah Noah suite, uh, are the pieces of end grain boxwood, boxwood, I'm sorry, that means uh, boxwood cut perpendicularly to the direction of the fibers assembled together and sold commercially, which normally uh, wood engrave is indeed you. So a close look at, at these. Uh, makes it also possible to understand a, a lot in the way about the way that Gauguin worked. Uh, also, when one then compares it with impressions and looks into the relationship between the blocks and between impressions. So on the left, we see Harriet holding the wood block for Gauguin's print Maruru from the Noah Noah suite. On the right, various impressions being disposed for examination on the uh, thankfully large table of the prints and drawings department. And on top, a proposed reconstruction of a frieze-like display of Gauguin's so later so-called Volard suite of 1998-1999. And Harriet, by examining closely these works, also uh, came to the conclusion that some of them had been cut from the two, in the two sides of the same piece of wood. And that also is very useful to understand the genesis of the of this series. Um, <clears throat> Comparing the, as I said, woodblock and impressions, um, and the various impressions, one also understands how for Gauguin, printing itself was a creative act. The sort of con continuing poiesis, if you wish. That is, the making of the work of art was not finished with carving the woodblock, it went on with printing. Uh, it was not simply the transmission of the information deposited by uh, cutting in, into the block. Um, as can be seen by comparing the treatment of the, the recumbent body of the woman in Manao to Papau um, in the block, that is the block, uh, with the needle and later with the burin, uh, which is perfectly recognizable on the right in this posthumous printing of the block by Gauguin's son, Pola, in 1921, because Pola managed to devise a way of printing by using two different rubbers, one soft, one hard, so as to get all of the information that was in the block. It's almost a sort of uh, ra radiograph, if you wish, of the block. But this is not at all what Gauguin wanted. That does not, it gives us a lot of information, but it does, does not correspond to the images that he wanted to uh, produce. Uh, and this, which is one of his impressions get you a much better idea. And remarkably, this very fine and, and careful delineation and modeling of the body is replaced by a very different uh, technique by uh, wiping and twilling that is applying a fabric on the inked block in order to produce a softer appearance, more sensuous and in a sense more painterly. Uh, Gauguin's impressions um, are extremely varied and I think that they can and maybe should be compared to different interpretations of a musical score. Um, in uh, one impression, uh, in this one, here, uh, for instance, the outline, and I, I bring the, the painting in the Albright Knox Gallery uh, to identify the uh, iconography. Uh, you see that the Tupapau, the spirit of the dead, leaning against a pole here, they are illegible, and uh, someone who encounters only this woodcut, this print, cannot possibly understand what is depicted or referred to, to there. Uh, they become simple 
um, uh, they are extraordinarily enigmatic, and the dark ground is merely interrupted by enigmatic flashes of light. In another one, here, um, ah, okay, in another one, also by Gauguin, which was obtained by printing the book three times in black, brown, and gray. On the contrary, the Tupapau is emphasized with a luminous eye and mouth and a sort of brooding sphinx-like presence. And therefore, from one impression to the to next, the emphasis tends to shift and different aspects of the work uh, come to, uh, to the fore. I believe that this variety and this variability uh, produced by this way of printing uh, is to some extent comparable to Gauguin's exploitation in three-dimensional work of multiple viewpoints. Uh, the Germans have a wonderful expression for that, mehr Ansichtigkeit. <coughs> um, so the fact of having for a same object various uh, relevant viewpoints. Um, to produce, and this Gauguin used, among other things, to produce ambiguity and the suggestion of various images, what I like to call polyiconicity. So we have this, uh, again, Lida and the Swan, and the drawing, the, the watercolor on the left, which is at Vassar College, uh, shows us twice the, the same vase from different viewpoints. Uh, and then another vase, which is in Copenhagen, uh, of a bus, female bus with a, a belt in the shape of a, of a snake. And I think that, on the one hand, these two depictions of the same vase from different viewpoints do make it clear how much Gauguin was interested in this variety of appearances of the same object depending on the viewpoint. But on the other hand, I think he also made it obvious that depending on the viewpoint, uh, the interpretation, it was not just a matter of details. The work itself really morphs. Uh, is subjected to a metamorphosis. And for instance, the fact that the handle, which is also the neck of the goose and the swan, suggests a snake, becomes clearer when also compared with this uh, snake uh, belt. Gauguin also resorted to what we like to call chance, and again, which I think is a way of distributing or delegating uh, agency. For instance, in some uh, impressions of Mana Novahua Ino, the day of the evil spirit, which we have already uh, seen, subjected to uh, analysis, some um, uh, we find optical and textual effects. This is a polar impression here. Here, this is a Goga impression. And you see here this remarkable texture, which was obtained apparently with the help of a, wax, a waxy medium. And here, it helps to intimate the sort of uncanny presence um, looming above the lovemaking couple on the left, which is the subject of another uh, print of the Noah Noah Suite, Te Faroru, which you see on, on the right. And this becomes maybe more visible if one compares the details of uh, polar uh, impression where you see the needle, the work done with needle and with buran here. It remains very abstract and ambiguous, but there is the suggestion of something. Here we have this extraordinary uh, texture obtained with this waxy medium, and on the right here we have much more clearly, much more explicitly, a head above the couple in the uh, Mauru. Now, this sort of insubstantial apparition carried by the smoke of the surf has been logically interpreted as uh, that of a supernatural uh, entity. Henri Dora suggested to identify it as the image of Tefatu, the destructive god of earth and of earthquakes. Um, another effect produced by this is an effect, I believe, of animation, for which Gauguin also used off-register printing. And, and I like to speak of the uh, the, the mobility of the fixed image. Uh, we often find in exhibitions of contemporary art, for instance, this as unfair competition of the moving image and the fixed image. But the notion of the fixed image is very wrong because fixed images are actually imply movement, but this movement takes place in the mind of the viewer and in the process of perception. Now it becomes particularly obvious here with these uh, off-register printings on the left of Nave Nave Fenua, Fragrant Isle, printed in black ink over ochre, over yellow, with red ink on ivory uh, paper. And on the right, this larger, later print of 1894-95, also entitled Manau uh, Tupapau, uh, in which we have here two prints in the, in the collection, and the one 
below is particularly spectacular. Um, Goga used stencil for the coloring of this print, and the one below was printed in black, and the block seems to have slipped during printing. Um, so it may have been in part accidental, but I think an important thing uh, is the fact that Goga kept it and therefore regarded it as worth uh, preserving. Um, other interesting discoveries is his use of recto and verso, of the two sides of a work on, on paper. So here, for instance, we have this remarkable work, Women with a Cat, of around 1900, which is a transfer drawing in round, brownish black ink on the recto. But on the verso, which you see here, Gauguin added graphite and blue crayon pencil with brush and solvent washes. And if one looks at uh, that with transmitted light, we see that the two come together. And so I think there are reasons to think that he wanted to use it as a sort, if you wish, a bit like a stained glass that is with light coming through. And the result is something that is more than the addition of the two sides and maybe related to his various uses of glass and including of glass, uh, glass uh, decoration. And a recent, for me, discovery in something that I think needs to be worked on more, again on recto verso, is we knew already that uh, Gauguin had reused some of the impressions that made under his direction by Louis Roy, which are simpler, were meant to produce a more straightforward edition um, with the use of stencil, stencils and, and clear, simple color. Now, some of these impressions he took with him and he cut into pieces and reused to print on the other side new uh, impressions, new, new cuts. And it has generally been understood that this meant uh, probably that he did not think highly of these impressions since he just recycled them. But looking more closely, also with the help of Harriet Stratis, looking more closely at what is on the other side, uh, I have started to wonder whether uh, there was more to it than that. So for instance, if we look at this very important document on the right, which is these two different impressions of the important woodcut ovary that Gauguin uh, pasted uh, side to side and sent and gave to Stéphane Mallarmé with the inscription, cette étrange uh, figure. Uh, if one looks on the other side, one finds twice details from the uh, woodcut Mana Novarua uh, Ino, and especially of the important detail of this bonfire, which is a sort of supernatural presence and replace uh, uh, the image of an idol or some sort of uh, a godly entity that one sees in an earlier, in a study for the painting uh, Upa Upa. So the fact that in both cases it is this image which, by the way, in its outline, does bear some relationship to the Vauviri figure, suggests that maybe for him uh, there was a connection between the two, and the fact that they were on both sides of the same support may have been uh, meaningful. Coming to my last point, in, in simpler cases uh, of impressions, we see how Gauguin uh, was interested in the uh, textual effect of embossing. And for instance, here in this impression of the uh, Atua, we have on uh, below, we have a print by Louis Roy with this very clear cut, thanks to stencil, uh, divisions of color, but on the top we have a, a, an impression by Gauguin himself in which he used apparently only traces of brown ink which had been left for an earlier impression. So the, res the result is a sort of gaufrage, it is just a question of surface essentially, and the result is quite extraordinary uh, because it is both extraordinary material and at the same time has a sort of supernatural aura it seems to dissolve. It is a sort of apparition that calls to mind the a uh, popular so-called photography of the invisible, which came into its fore a few years later in the 1890s. And I'm showing you here the, the very famous photograph of the Holy Shroud of, of Turin, which was made uh, by uh, Secondo Pia, uh, and at the, at the time of the beginning, by the way, of the radio of uh, X-ray uh, photography, and which had a tremendous uh, impact because people thought that 
suddenly they saw in the shroud the appearance of the, the divinity. And, and it was actually in the negative rather than in the positive. So here we had something, it was, it's 1898, uh, it's the year after uh, Röntgen's uh, invention of the X-ray, and the impact was a bit uh, comparable and connected with the extraordinary cultural impact of the invention of the uh, X-ray. And I keep that image for the end. Because I think so, my conclusion is that uh, indeed uh, art history profits enormously, I speak here as an art historian, from the dis this development of these techniques of inquiry into the making of the work of art and its material uh, uh, substance. But this is a matter of dialogue and we need to foster that dialogue and I think it should become much more widespread and this, uh, what is happening here, is helping enormously to that. It is not an autonomous revelation of the machine itself which would produce truth. And I say that only because we've seen that with neuroscience, uh, there's a fascination produced by these images which seem to come from below the surface indeed, and uh, seem to make it possible to see truth uh, in itself, directly with our own eyes. And of course these are prostheses, they eventually always are connected and need to be interpreted by the human eye, and therefore we are always all involved in that, and that I think we should remember but this is really rather an encouragement to continue the discussion. So thank you for your uh, attention. <clears throat> In just a moment, I'll ask the speakers to return to the stage and I will pass the mic to my co-collaborator, um, George Shackelford but I didn't want to miss the opportunity um, to open the floor for a couple questions for Dario specifically um, before we open the conversation further. Dario, thank you. That was fascinating in so many ways. I, I want to I ask you if you might say something more in the, the register of what was one of your key categories, namely the category of agency, because one of the things that's so fascinating here, never mind Pola's later involvement, but what you actually have here is you have this remarkable coexistence and kind of dialogue between two primary agents, Paul Gauguin and what, what's it? Louis Roy. Yeah. The other, um, the other printer, and I, I don't quite understand how we should understand the sort of deferral of primary printer agency to Louis Roy. You said in some cases when he wanted to produce a clearer edition, because it seems to me that the way in he messes with various kinds of effects that can only be gotten in certain kinds of idiosyncratic printing processes to all of us and say, oh, well, sometimes he handed it over to someone else. How do we understand the refashioning of printing agency when it's handed over to the, the someone else? Could you say a few more words about that? Oh, yes, certainly. So I, I'll try and not be too long because one could go on for a long time. Um, not much is known. So that's the first thing, and I think that's much more general. So because the tendency, and this is due in part to the, to, to some extent it's ideology also, the, the notion of art as undivided labor, yeah, sure. and the importance of the hand of the master, mm -hmm. and this is also shortly, it, it's, it was not so long before that, that one started producing limited editions, all of them signed by the artist and numbered and so on. So you have this notion that the, the art, and that corresponds well to, to Gauguin's own um, understanding of the true to the material aesthetics, if you wish. So he's really hands-on all the time. Nonetheless, uh, printmaking uh, is a collaborative process, and there was always an involvement of professional printmakers, etc. But this has tended to be, um, with the uh, épreuve d'artiste and so on, this has tended to, to be, this had to be to some extent sorted in the background, if you wish. So one does not speak too much. People knew about that. There were very important uh, master printers 
Klo, for instance, who could be very important in, in the, the actual work. They would actually go to artists and say, you know what, thanks to transfer, you, can, you don't need to know how to make prints. You can make prints and so on. So, and I think there's slowly a growing interest into these various agents, uh, a, grow, so a growing over openness also to, to giving justice to their involvement. Maybe to some extent, uh, as I said, we live now in a time of allography that is in the time when um, the visual arts, the fine arts, just as architecture has been for a very long time forever, it does not mean that the artist does the thing, right? So we have these fabricators. Um, so I think that this is, this, is, uh, this is changing also. So to come back to Gauguin. Um, I have proposed in my entries and, and some um, ideas about that, but still, it's to some extent conjectural. Gauguin seems to have wanted to accompany his narration, uh, I mean, his story of his stay in, in, Gauguin, in uh, Tahiti, Noah Noah, with images, a set of 10 images. So that would have meant producing a sort of edition of them. Uh, however, the result, the way he printed, means that each, each impression is different. No, that, that's, it's wonderful for us, but it's very inconvenient as, as a process, if you wish. Now, we don't know whether he just got carried away, that's quite possible, by, by the sheer fun of it, and, and, and I think he learned a lot also for his painting and so on. In any case, um, at some point he turned to this Louis Roy, who does not seem, interestingly, to have had much experience as far as printing was concerned either, so this is also, that's one of the many oddities. And together, apparently, they devised this uh, rather nice technique with this stencil. And I mean, these are completely different impressions. They look completely different. They, they have their own qualities. They are much more flatter. So, but some of them are extraordinarily strong and striking and so on. This made it possible. And we assume that there were some 25 or so impressions of each. But, but no one has managed, I, I, guess, I think, to have the complete calculation, etc. But this was not published either, really. I mean, there was no. But maybe, bec maybe because of the problems with Charles Maurice and the text and so on. So we don't quite know, but um, hopefully we'll know more. I mean, once the question are, are asked, th th there's a chance. And as I said, I really, I really hope very much from crowd, uh, crowd sourcing there. So maybe. Okay. So, so, so thank you very much. And there's more to continue to talk about. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. It was probably long, but you no, touched no, no, a very. No. <laughs> very no, more is more, right? Complicated, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Thanks. Why don't we have the rest of the speakers join you on the stage? Hmm. And I'll turn the mic over to George. For the very few of you who weren't here last night, um, I'm George Shackelford, the Deputy Director of the Kimball Art Museum, and uh, I've been asked to be a kind of respondent or organizer of a series of questions uh, for the speakers this afternoon. But I hope what we have to say here um, won't prohibit, what we're doing, talking amongst ourselves, won't have anything, won't um, prohibit anybody from standing up and shouting and saying, no, 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 I want you to talk about this instead, please. Uh, what, one of the things that struck me is that, um, that we have, we've had two talks today about the sort of single masterpiece. On the one hand, Anne's talk about Manet, Ellis' talk about the, um, uh, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, about uh, Kelly's talk about the Kaibot, and then two talks about bodies of material. And one of the things that, that happens is that, you know, Pache, the fact that you're a university professor, you are all working in museums that have, you're working with a museum in this case, with Chicago, where there's an extraordinary richness of material information about uh, whether coming out of the individual huge masterpiece or the collective body of, of, um, of works of art that you have at your disposal. And I wonder whether you all have thoughts about, um, about you know, the difference in working on a project like the Monet catalog resume um, for, for Chicago versus the Kaibot, where there are, you know, a handful of things, but big ones. 
the, uh, the, the ongoing life of the Van Gogh Museum as a center for Van Gogh studies uh, perpetually, um, there, there's a really big difference between the way in which a smaller museum would work on a single, a single work of art than, than you guys can get in your, in your experience of having a lot of the same kinds of things to look at um, uh, simultaneously. Any thoughts? Perhaps my question wasn't <laughs> sufficiently. <laughs> no, but I mean, what, what is it about the museum environment fundamentally that, that, that makes, uh, that, that influences the nature of your work? Well, I, yeah. um, is this working? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think what excites people who work in museums is the fact that we do work collaboratively. And one of the also very exciting things about, for conservation, is we're a very small um, group of people for the most part when we collaborate among ourselves too. I mean, the amount of conversation that has been taking place over the last two days um, among our conservation colleagues, in addition to listening to the talks and commenting on the talks, if somebody's working on a picture, they're asking somebody all about it. If somebody's planning an exhibition, a, a curator's planning an exhibition, they're, they're talking to us about it. So I think um, certainly, even, whether the museum's large or small, if a museum does have a conservation department, they usually work very closely with the curatorial department and the scientists who are in conservation. And I think um, that's what's, what's very exciting. And it doesn't really matter whether you're working in a museum like Van Gogh Museum, where there's only you know, a focus on one artist or a museum like the Art Institute or the National Gallery, um, we're always focusing, and we're doing a lot of projects at once, but if we're a conservator and we're treating a picture, we're focusing on that artist at that point. And the luxury of working in a large museum, of course, is we also have the prints and drawings. We can go up and look at the drawings when we're working on a Van Gogh or on a, you know, on a Dugar. I looked at the, the Manet prints when I'm working on the Manet. So that's, that's a luxury that we have, but it's something that, for conservators, um, is tremendously important. I think it, it, it's very much um, the actual process of doing the research, whether you're looking at one painting, it's a cumulative yes. process. So uh, often it's a question of, as it has been pointed out with what's been going on at the Art Institute of Chicago over the years, it's, it's a sort of cumulative process of building up a body of knowledge. So I don't think the, of course the resources are fantastic that you have this in-house knowledge, you have people that are knowledgeable about the letters, you have art historians, you have all the different aspects together. Um, but the actual process of doing the study, whether it's one work, you, you can only do one at a time sort of thing. Uh, so it's just a, a question of time of building this up. And particularly with cataloging projects, it's a very important step in um, building up over the years and realizing even with one artist like Van Gogh, how many variations there are within a very short time span. So I thought when I started to work in the Van Gogh Museum, it could be a bit boring. You know, it's just one artist, but, right. <laughs> but um, I certainly don't know everything about him yet. So you just, but you're just looking at very small time frames in the, the, because he's so experimental. So you're looking at very huge differences between one month and the next sometimes. But, sure. but uh, I think, yeah, the, you know, if you're working in a smaller museum, which I've also done in my previous life, <laughs> Uh, then you have to search for the collaborations and the input that you need and the, the, the broader reference. So it's just a different starting point. Well, and one of the things that I, that I thought about earlier was literally the, the, you, in Kelly's case, you had just the right objects. You, you had at your, at your fingertips, if you will, or in, in your sphere of, of research, just the right objects. Dario, with you and the work that you were doing with Harriet, it, it, ha it is, terrifically important that the Art Institute of Chicago is probably the greatest single repository of, graphic, of the graphic art of Paul Gauguin anywhere else, anywhere in the world. So it's a bit like being the Van Gogh Museum of Gauguin for Gauguin's graphics, that you, you have more examples there. Um, and your, your, your experience is, of course, built, if you'll forgive me, on a, a lifetime of observing Manet. And, um, and so a, a sort of, you're talking about the cumulative experience of, of, of years. And so there, there is a very, 
I, I wanted to just point that, in a sense, we're quite privileged. In you know, when I was in Boston, you know, there were 40 Monets in my care, and and when I was in Boston, there was the Gauguin um, de Venonu, and I was working on an exhibition about, about Gauguin. So you could travel everywhere, see everything. Do you know? And Boston has probably the second best collection of of Gauguin's graphics in the world. So. I'm, I'm struck now by having been at a smaller museum, and for the people who are in the in the audience who aren't necessarily in, a, you know, dealing with a sort of powerhouse kind of institution, the, I, I, I note that it's often more difficult to to make those kinds of connections and to and to understand the um, the relationships between things as 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 we have been so privileged to to do. May I? Yeah, absolutely. I add something to that, which is that with privilege comes responsibility. And I think that um, s such things as these um, exhibitions and projects and catalogs, and, and including or especially these online scholarly catalogs, I think are very much a way of, of um, assuming this responsibility and sharing yes. the result of this uh, cumulative knowledge um, with everyone because the access will be universal, which is extraordinary. Absolutely. Of course, it does not replace the direct access no. too, but, uh, but nonetheless, it, it helps a lot. And, and also, I mean, uh, people will travel, and I think, again, it, it's rather a, an encouragement to come and see things when you really right. want to see them and work on them. But I think it's, it's sharing also. Well, and I think that the, the art history that's being written nowadays that acknowledges um, even if the even if the conservator or the research scientist is not the 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 named author of the text, when the author is again and again referring to the physical things that he or she has discovered in collaboration with the scientist or the conservator, um, that just strengthens everyone's recognition of the fact that this uh, that this collaboration is critical and it must be more advertised. It must be more put put to the fore in, in, and acknowledged in all of our, in all of our writings and, and publications. Um, what, uh, do you all have any observations on each other's talks? I'm wondering uh, whether, no, I know, but I mean, there, you, there must have been, I mean, I, I, I asked you a couple of questions out there, I, I'm, and, and Dario, you asked um, questions of Anne. Did, did, it, did things come, come up to you that you were thinking in the process of, of doing, or shall we open the, the floor to other questions? Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I was uh, interested because you were also, in a way, talking about recycling uh, materials and that this, um, and looking more at processes, and that this actual re recycling of materials becomes an intrinsic part of the, the meaning of the object or the, the content of the object of the finished product. I think, and, it, and maybe it's not the same thing, but it made me start thinking that um, we're very much looking into processes, so we're doing all this technical research, so we're identifying materials, we're looking at layer structure, but what it is about in the end is looking at the, the process behind it, and I think, yeah, this may be a very obvious fact uh, to make, but that's what all the talks had in common, yeah. so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Now, if I, I would add that uh, <clears throat> one can think, all right, it's another question, so we can be interested in the work as such and so on, but it's, there's another aspect, which is how is it made? But there's a strong connection, certainly in the case of the artist we have been discussing, with, I think, their way of understanding what art making is about. Because they were deeply interested in the process as such. And then they also, at least some of them, tended to leave something. I think I, I liked very much and your, your way of showing how uh, Manet pointed at uh, these layers. And, and apparently wanted people to be aware that it had not come just like that, but that there was something below. And therefore, as I said, this revelation, because there is something that can be at some extent, to some extent, also sometimes suspicious about this sort of extraordinary desire to unveil, to see what is below, and to dismiss the surface, the surface I'm sorry, in favor of some depth. But on the other hand, many of them were, were working and playing with layers, and with this intimation that under the visible layer, there's something else that is important also, but that maybe you can never completely Retrace. So there, there is this element of, of play also, which I think well, is important. And I think that the, the Kayabat and the Manet were interesting because I've had this luxury of looking at a lot of Kayabat in the last year. Mm -hmm. And he, from what you, from your talk and all the work you've done, it's obviously he, he's 
fascinating with process, and you've identified it, but you don't see Kaibat's process on the surface of his paintings um, the way you do with, you know, an artist like like Manet or Duga or Toulouse Trek or Picasso. They're they're really throwing it in your face, yes. and I think it's interesting that Kaibat you have to you have to search a lot more. I mean, they're, and they're different personalities. They're different kind of artists. I think that that was one of the things that was most interesting, at least to me, was that, you know, on the surface, you can see it looks very well constructed. We expected it to be, at least I did, fairly straightforward. You know, he drew this out, he painted it. But the sort of everything in that painting is tweaked and reworked and things are scraped back. So like you say, we may never know, you can't know what's under there, you just know it's gone. Um, and so there's evidence under the surface that all these changes have taken place, but you see none of that from the surface. You don't see it. And, I mean, there's just no clue. You know, the, there were things that I didn't mention, but like the cobblestones, for example, were completely reworked at some point. Um, and so it's just, it's kind of amazing what, what all was under there in that way. Well, I, I, w I would say that I have, um, just listening to just literally the four of you, I've been thinking about, um, uh, you know, future uh, Friday evening lecture topics, uh, one of which is on the edge, um, about the things that happen on the edge, that happen in the process of making something on the edge of the object. And then, uh, Dario, when you were showing the Parsifal and the sort of Sybil figure, I wonder whether the not the Sybil figure comes out of uh, the Parsifal, but the other way around, that the Sybil is first and the Parsifal might be second. And yeah, okay, great, yeah. So, th so there's no surprise that the eye is in the Parsifal, in fact, because it's the, because it was always there. Yeah, exactly, it was the other way around. But the, 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 the fact of the, that an artist might take something and he might also even take something by somebody else and, um, and repurpose it uh, as Degas did taking a plate that Mary Cassatt had worked on and turned it 90 degrees and worked on it himself and then made it something that was his. Or in, in the case in the monotype show, um, certainly Lauren will attest that, the, that unfortunately they couldn't be together in the exhibition because one is in Boston and can't be lent, but there's a, mo a monotype where he, and you showed the one that he turns upside down, takes the impression, turns it upside down and makes it be a different thing. And he does that more than more than once. So um, this this notion of of, of um, cannibalizing either your own work or the work of someone else is another is another pan artist uh, idea that is I think well worth uh, well worth exploring the um, the notion of embedding in your own work uh, uh, something that you've already made or that someone else is uh, that someone else made. It's only certain kinds of artists who do that. It's a uh, certain type of personality. Yes. And a certain way of looking at art, and Absolutely. it's intriguing that some would never consider doing it. No, much too much too timid to do it. And what is it? That it was the, the the famous adage that the artist who borrows and the artist who steals that it's the great artist who steals or perhaps eats the the work of his predecessor. Yeah, yeah. I think we should ask for some questions from the audience. Aren't aren't there some? And please do come down to the mic, Travers, if you will. Sorry, um, because I think this is being. If this is not only being live streamed but recorded, um, you could be at home in in um, in your pajamas watching us on the stage, <laughs> if you were lucky. I can't tell. All right, good. If you're contemplating a symposium with the Orsay for the Gauguin exhibit, I, a little story, if you'll allow me. In '89, Wojtek and I contributed a paper on Gauguin his te techniques, and Wojtek presented it, and at the end, all the presenters were invited to the stage. Wojtek looked at me and said, well, aren't you gonna join me? And I said, okay. Walking down the aisle, the director of the Orsay, Francois Cachin, stood up and blocked me. And she said something more along the lines of, le monsieur, il y a pas le titre. And it's true, I don't have a PhD. And Wojtek, in his perfect French, said, well, if he's not invited, I'm not invited. To show you something, the character of the man. And she sat down. And the, the auditorium was full. I, I couldn't tell 500 French people. And many of the questions were on technique. I was the only conservator up there. And I remember distinctly, they asked, why are so many of the Amer uh, paintings from American museums varnished, whereas none are varnished 
in the Russian museums. And uh, I've been thinking about that because in your exhibit, something I think that needs addressing is Gauguin's attitudes towards finish, which is complicated. Now, the, Ella well knows the portrait of Vincent painting sunflowers, extremely matte, extremely dry. Uh, I worked at the Clark Art Institute on that big panel, Soy Mysterieuse, that's now in the Orsay from his you know, entrance to his hut. Very thin polychrome, and I, I, as far as I could tell, it had never been cleaned or restored, and it looked like it had an original wax finish. We didn't have a conservation uh, scientist on staff, so I wasn't able to verify. And then the uh, self-portrait near Golgotha that I showed from Sao Paulo, that had fairly extensive glazing in the background over the two uh, Tahitian faces. So just something for further study. Do I see someone else coming down to ask a question? Yes. Excellent. Yes, uh, outsider question again. Please. Um, you talked, uh, some of you talked about uh, when they were researching on the, some of the paintings that uh, the painting actually was not originally thought to have been painted by the painter. It was then had to be later reinstated. And uh, I'm kind of curious what happens to the individual who said, oops, it's not a Gauguin, sorry, made a mistake. You know, so I was wondering what happens in that dialogue and, and what happens to the museum that owns it and all that sort of thing. So, thanks. Ella, that's yours, <laughs> I'm afraid to say. I, I could feel that coming. Um, <laughs> well, the example I showed, for example, in the, the Kuala Mulu Museum, so, of course, the museum was uh, really at the, also the driving force behind this uh, Examination, and I think that the the point is we, where we were talking about whether you look at one artist or we look at a large body of works by one artist, or, um, that your your research is never finished. So of course, we uh, as the years go on through these cataloging projects. If I'm talking about Van Gogh, for example, then we have much more comparative material. So things that were looked at maybe 20, 30 years ago, um, technical examinations really only started uh, in the late 80s, the first case studies, so um, you know, we have just so much more information, so it's, I think in true scholarship, you never say the last word, and um, the museum always makes clear that it's based on what we know at the present moment, and it's the opinion of the museum, but of course every scholar is free uh, to have another opinion, but I think this kind of research, we're never, we're never finished with it because, you know, well, there's, a, yeah. there's a famous uh, case of the Rembrandt Research Project that uh, will probably, you know, finish its work and then start all over again. And the, all the Rembrandts that were rejected, or many of the Rembrandts that were rejected in the, in the first round may come back again to be uh, work. And there's a case where technical analysis, I know we're talking about the 19th century here, but all of that attribution and deattribution was done largely without the benefit of any, of any kind of technical assistance or any kind of, and, uh, and, and it would have been the ideal opportunity to insist that every work of art be subjected to the same technical analysis before a decision was made. Um, that, that's, that kind of, I think now that, for instance, there's a, there's a technical report online for every one of the Monets in Chicago will mean that there is now a sort of standard, a baseline set for what anybody who wants to study a painting by Monet needs to do to, um, to have completed the, the, the depth of all possible research. And you know, new techniques of um, transmitted IRR, uh, which a lot of people don't regularly do, will, will become, I think, a, a new source of investigation. And everyone will try, let's try all of these things before we get to before we think that we've fully understood the object. And so that's, I think that's exactly right. The misattribution or, or reattribution, um, I know a painting that was in Boston that was a heralded painting by Goya in the, in the 19th century, a very famous picture, then resigned to being a, a, a completely wrong attribution, not a fake, but a, but a misattributed period painting, and was even included in an exhibition about 
forgeries and deceptions, and now people think it's by Goya again. So it's, uh, it, it, it's not impossible that this can happen again and again. So. All right, I'm afraid that we're at time now. So George, Dario, Anne, Ella, Kelly, thank you so much for helping us push these questions into some new territory. And to our audience, thank you for joining us for the day and helping us develop this conversation. So a round of applause for everyone.